Harvard Divinity School. Essays on Women in Western Esotericism, Beyond Seeresses and Sea Priestesses, February 22nd, 2023. Good afternoon and welcome to our first Nosiologies event of the spring term. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I'm the host of this series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative of the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science, these ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. Going beyond dichotomies such as body and mind, ordinary and extraordinary, reason and experience, and matter and spirit. This series hosts scholars at, of different disciplines and practitioners interested in exploring and expanding the boundaries of what counts as knowledge today. Today I have the honor and pleasure to be here with Dr. Amy Hale and Dr. Krista Shusko. So you can show your faces now. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Krista. Hi, Amy. So Amy um, has a PhD in folklore and mythology from UCLA. Her research on writing ranges from contemporary Cornwall to modern pagan and occult subcultures in the United States and in the United Kingdom, and modern esoteric and occult artists. She has addressed topics as diverse as modern Druidry, Cornish ethnonationalism, pagan religious tourism, color theory, the occult, and extremist politics in modern paganism. Amy is a writer about the occult, culture, art, women, and Cornwall in various combinations, and content director of the Last Tuesday Society. She is also the author of Eithel Colhoun, Genius of the Fern Loved Gully. Thank you, Amy, for being here, and sorry for the pronunciation. I mean, I'm still <laughs> struggling with that. You won't, you, you won't be the first, you won't be the last. So go ahead. thank you so much, Giovanna, for having us here. Wonderful. And welcome, Krista. Krista Shusko has a PhD in religion from Syracuse University. And she has published numerous scholars, scholarly books, chapter on 19th and 20th century American esotericism on topics such as fin de siècle Martian romances and seance spiritualism in the United community. And she serves as co-chair for the Esotericism Unit of the American Academy of Religion. Currently pursuing an MA in Digital Humanities and at Linnaeus University in Sweden. She has also recently taught courses in religion at the University of Gothenburg and in Digital Humanities at Linnaeus University. Thank you, Krista, for being here with us. Emmy, you actually are, um, you know, the second time you are in Nosiology, so welcome back and welcome, Krista. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here for my first time. Hopefully not my last. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I hope so. So uh, I'm very happy to have you with us. And today we're going to present um, the edited volume essays on women in Western esotericism, beyond seeresses and sea priestesses, and this has some of the latest and pressing, I would say, topics um, in the study of esotericism today. Moreover, if we have time, I would love to um, take the opportunity to think about the opportunities and challenges of inhabiting this field as women and scholars. So uh, I hope uh, we'll be able to touch on all these topics today. And I will start from a question to to you, Amy, but actually to both of you, um, before delving into the strictly academic aspects of this book, I have a background question. Um, from your introduction and from the book as a whole, it emerges, at, at least from you know, how I approach it, that um, this book is not written only to fill a scholarly gap. Don't get me wrong. It does feel a scholarly gap, but there's more to it. And so my first question would be, Amy, why did you decide to read this book? I mean, is there a backstory, a personal anecdote, something that really made you think, yes, I want, I need 
to edit a book on Western, on women in Western esotericism and with those specific colleagues. <laughs> Yes, um, well, first I want to really thank the Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions for, for hosting this and for allowing for this uh, really fun and I think important conversation. So Krista was there at the inception of this, this book. Um, I had been working on Ethel Calhoun's life for a number of years and so I'd already had kind of the pump primed for looking at and really considering the lacunae in, um, in the scholarship about women in esotericism in general, um, because she had kind of emerged as this, you know, this, this lost figure in both surrealism and occult history. And uh, so I was at the American Academy of Religion annual meeting. I was kind of, you know, wandering the book aisles and I was looking at the uh, the most recent offerings on what has been until recently and is still contested as a term, Western esotericism. And I was looking through the books and I saw that there was a pattern that um, when women were considered in a lot of the, the scholarly collections and the monographs, that they were either kind of lumped together as a group. So there'd be a chapter on women, whereas men were frequently given uh, richer and more deeper histories and biographies. And also in a very troubling way to me that women scholars were not maybe as well represented as they could have been and as I knew them to be because I obviously had friends and colleagues who were women. And I was seeing this and even though I had completely sworn off forever doing another edited collection. I was upstairs at the, uh, at I think it was the program unit chairs party. And I saw Krista there and I said, look, I've got this idea. I said, I think this really needs to happen. And uh, Krista, of course, said it was a brilliant idea. And uh, from there, I started working with a team of really fantastic colleagues. Uh, we spoke again at the ASE meeting and started talking about what this might look like. And so uh, worked with uh, Krista and Alison Kuder and uh, Nell Shampoo and uh, Elizabeth Lowry and uh, Kathy Gutierrez, really kind of the core team of people who talked about what this collection would look like. But it was also really important to me in putting this together, as you said, that we didn't just focus on women and women's histories, but there was also a story that I wanted to tell and be a little bit more frank about, about women's scholarship. And even though the, uh, the, the collection does have some, uh, some scholars who do not identify as women, that that is really the bulk of the scholarship that is, uh, that is featured in the book. And I also, as is noted in the introduction and in the conclusion, that the fact that a lot of this was put together in 2020 and in the events surrounding the pandemic gives us an opportunity to really look even more deeply at women's challenged relationships with scholarship and with particularly with uh, academic institutions, because this volume also reflects a number of scholars who have different or even non-existent uh, relationships with academic institutions, like myself, I'm, I'm a freelance scholar now. So it, I'd like to think the volume does a number of things. Wonderful. Do you have anything to add, Krista, to, you know, I mean, you were part of this, uh, not, this story, so. <laughs> yes, I feel very lucky to have been there at the inception and to have some of these wild conference conversations about what this book could be. I think I was probably more of, you know, the little devil on the shoulder for Amy just saying, yes, 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 do it, do it. Um, and knowing how difficult it is to edit um you know, edit a collection and to do that work of uh, scholar wrangling that she did so admirably uh, in in very difficult times. Uh, I think that that work of editing scholarly collections, uh, I've never done it myself, but I've seen other people do it who, who I'm close to. And that's a difficult task in the best of times. And these were obviously not the best of times. 
Um, so I, I was very excited uh, when it when it finally emerged uh, through all of that. Thanks a lot. So now now let's delve into the book. So the book is divided in four parts. After a very informative introduction that I will quote at length today, Amy. The four parts are race, place, and othering, locating the feminine, rethinking influence, power, and authority, and embodiment. And we can all see how you really touch on very, very key topic, not only for the study of Western esotericism and esotericism, but also for you know today's lives of, of all of us. Um, so um, my first question starts with some quotes from your introduction, Amy. So you write that the study of women in esotericism has been framed as marginal or as a sideline to the histories of men. And that the academic history of esotericism has largely been until recently a story told by, about, and for other men through the lenses of men's experience. And the question becomes then not to how women's stories should fit into this dominant narrative, but how women's experiences challenge and break the narrative itself. So do you, both of you want to comment on this and maybe um, tell us a, a bit more about, um, yes, this aspect of, of the book? Sure, sure. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting because in, in the book as it emerged, uh, there tended to be, for the most part, studies of particular types of women who uh, tended to be of a an upper and more literate class tended to be 19th century. And I think that that reflects a lot of the um, of, of the scholarship rather than the potentials for the scholarship, which is uh, obviously a much, much broader topic. Uh, I think one of the areas for me, where the study of women really changes the narrative is particularly around the uh, the topic of class. And when we look at the way that a lot of, uh, and I'll say Western esotericism, because I think that that, as this book notes, I think that that Western esotericism as a discipline has had its own discourses that while they are being challenged, this is still a set of scholarly discourses that we're interacting with, even as we're unraveling them. And I think that part of the discourse of that field, as it has emerged, is uh, the story of men in conversation with broad philosophical and theoretical uh, societal conversations and philosophical conversations. And from that, we tend to have a particular set of class discourses. So when we talk about women and esotericism, and I think particularly women and magic, we start seeing a much wider participation that challenges some of those narratives. So we're not talking maybe about the big philosophical or historical or political conversations anymore. We're now starting to talk about, say, issues of agency, how we see the world, uh, how things get done, um, how esotericism and esoteric practices and magic end up being um, being very strategic ways that that women are are, are working in the world. And that's something that that uh, I think that the volume could have brought out. I think that there's a lot more work to be done, particularly on, say, magic and class, of course, race, culture, colonialism. Uh, and we see the touches of those in this book as well. But I really see this book as a starting point for those wider explorations that I think are so crucial to rethinking some of these wider discourses. Yes, Krista? I, I really appreciated too, Amy, in the introduction, 
the way that you placed your the, the position for both what you were intending to do and also what we as contributors were able to do uh, and, and sort of positioning it as not the, some kind of final word, of course, but as a, a step along the way to trying to uncover these different kinds of histories and experiences. Um, and I really think that that's important to, to, to do since I, I try to impress this on my students and I also try to impress it on myself, but we can become very attached to what it is that we study, of course. Um, and we can become very sometimes too precious about what it is that we study. And, and I think that what I've tried to do myself is to work to be less precious and more careful. And I think in being more careful than I'm able to disentangle those, maybe some of those attachments that I that I develop towards my object of study and be able to say, I could be very wrong about this. You know, uh, I hope that I'm not. And, and these are some things that I see now, but in five years, maybe I'll be terribly embarrassed about <laughs> what, what I wrote and the perspective that I took um, because, you know, I am where I am. Uh, and I think that that's something that I really appreciated with the, the collection as a whole. It's not to say that this is now wholly representative, but it is starting to try to represent um, experiences and uh, individuals and groups who may not have been highlighted uh, earlier. Yeah, I think it was just really a way of, of just putting putting important things out there. And I think that there is a tendency, and I know just on a very personal level, um, I don't know if this is a completely gendered behavior, it might be, but uh, there, there's a tendency to um, make the, the perfect the enemy of the good. And if, if, there to to have waited for the perfect perfectly inclusive work on this to come out then that would have taken a lot longer and been a lot it, it would have been impossible to have done at that moment so i think that being honest about where we are at any given moment and starting the conversation was um was really critical Thanks a lot. I think we'll maybe have the chance in this conversation to think about what can we do from here and possibilities that can be imagined how, you know, to write, you know, another um, edited volume or how to work towards more inclusion and diversity. For example, I can't ignore the three white cis women here talking about this. And, you know, you're very candid and, and straightforward, you know, your introduction also on, you know, um, this aspect of that, again, as you, both of you just said, uh, needs to be, you know, it's a, you see the book as a movement towards um, more diversity into the field. Um, and there's still, uh, there are th still things to do. But what, one of the things that I really think was, uh, extremely important to stress in, in the book and introduction, I'm quoting you again, is the tension between um, marginality or oppositional identity and mainstream and what I would call the ordinary and the extraordinary aspects of studying Western esotericism. Um, so you, you say that scholarship about women's roles and contribution to the esoteric milieu also challenges currently overarching narratives about the development of esotericism as a rejected category of thought. And you also say that many esoteric worldviews as neither neatly theorized, nor are they exercised in oppositional identity formation, esoteric beliefs and practices were and are likely just part of the fabric of already marginalized life. And, and, and I think that this is very important to, um, to stress because there's a tendency in wanting to concentrate in, in, um, in those who study magic or esoteric practices on exceptionality of altered set of consciousness, while the, the ordinary aspect of life, the everyday aspects of life are so important as well and, and I think personally that there's um, who wants to, who thinks the ordinary is boring, let's say, uh, 
is speaking from a place of privilege. Um, and so I want to maybe, if you want to expand about this aspect of the book, that of course um, is quite central because women are, were, were and are often marginalized also within this type of practice. Sure, and, and I'll, I'll give you a, a what I think is a really great example. So the other day I was able to, uh, I hosted this lecture for the last Tuesday Society, which is something that I do and something you know folks interested in the esoteric should check out. Uh, this was this really cool lecture by an archaeologist, a contract archaeologist called Wayne Perkins. And the subject of the lecture was actually magical midden deposits in homes. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this set of practices, uh, but basically what he is theorizing and a number of archaeologists are now looking at is the practice of depositing items in walls and in spaces in homes for in order to get probably varying degrees of uh, of magical protection in the home. So, you know, people have probably heard about the unfortunate practice of like, you know, either walling up cats or putting cats in walls, but there are all sorts of things that are found generationally in homes, particularly things like shoes and baby shoes. And what he's arguing is that this is actually a domestic practice. So this is a form of women's protection magic happening in the home. And it seems as though there are very few texts that actually support this. So you can't just go to a folklore collection and hear women talking about putting baby shoes in the walls. So this is something that's currently being theorized. Now, does this suggest something about a worldview? Absolutely. And how people think protection works, how people think spirits may be encased in material possessions, particularly in things like shoes that are and end up being very personal. But is this a a big, you know, is is this is this a, a big philosophical statement? Well, it reflects it reflects something about particularly worldviews, but how this sits in terms of bigger conversations about rationality, about religion, religiosity, I feel that it tells us something else about the everyday, about everyday concerns and everyday practices around those concerns. And a lot of those which are not literate at all, we find coming out of women and of the working class, the poorer classes, and these are things that absolutely fascinate me. And for me, this helps me rethink what the overall story of esotericism looks like and what it looks like when we include a variety of people who may who may be doing magic uh, in a very situational way. That's a very key question uh, also for me as a scholar. Even if we think about contemporary magic, um, I think there has been um an unnecessary emphasis on the extraordinary aspect of magic and less emphasis on the ordinary aspects of it and i think it's they would indeed change how we think about magic in general so thank you for this Mirak. i thought it was a brilliant but uh, you with your work krista you are a bit challenging this marginality slash mainstream sort of dichotomy which is of course um again a heuristic device because your uh, chapter in the book uh, is uh on um on a woman that I did not know, I have to confess, her name were her, you know, not real name, but it was Eleanor Kirk. And uh, your title, your chapter title is The Power of Beauty. And you tell the story of this American woman, and she might be the only American woman in the text, might be, or one of the few. I think it's the much more, um, the other um, topics of the book are much more centered towards European um and UK uh, oriented sort of uh, women. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit the story of Eleanor Kirk and uh, and the power of beauty? Sure, I just, I'm so fascinated now by these things in walls that I wanna talk more about that, but I'll, I'll refocus myself here on Eleanor Kirk. Uh, yeah, I think that Eleanor Kirk is someone that probably very few people have heard of. 
uh, in, in recent times, but was very popular in her day. She was a newspaper woman who um, was basically working and writing as a newspaper woman to support her family. It's not exactly clear, and it's a little hard to trace all of the biographical information about her life, but she was either widowed and or abandoned by a perhaps drunk husband uh, a couple of times <laughs> before she was 40, and she had five children to take care of and so started to work as um, a writer for newspapers in New York at the time. And she also became involved with the Women's Working Association, Working Women's Association, sorry, um, which was Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony's uh, organization that was kind of the predecessor organization to their later suffrage um, work. And she seems to have been very central in that they wanted her to take over the presidency when they were going to move on to these more um, national endeavors on suffrage. And she turned them down because she said, I need to, I need to work. You know, I, I, I am a working woman, so I don't really have time for, for doing too much more of this. Um, and her trajectory, I think, is really interesting in getting to the esoteric or the occult um, ideas. She was very skeptical throughout most of her life. Um, through the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And then it was in the 1890s when she starts to take up these ideas uh, and really, really embrace um, developments like mental science, which is where she's going to become very interested in beauty and the idea of health and immortality even, um, and trying to sort of use the powers of the mind. Uh, and also, you know, sometimes other external properties, uh, like other kinds of, uh, I don't know, kinds of coconut creams and other, <laughs> other sorts of products uh, that she thought could also assist in uh, helping women, especially to be beautiful. Um, and seeing that as a positive thing, as opposed to seeing that as something that is a negative sort of vain um, urge that women had, she th saw that as being a, an urge that she thought made sense, even if it was the case that many women sort of took up the quest for beauty in ways that she really frowned upon. So she was not like, yay, all women. She often was talking about how stupid <laughs> women were, or not stupid, but, you know, sort of mis misguided uh, in, in how they approached their, their lives and their health, especially. Um, and yeah, by the end of her life, she was thought she had had a, a, an experience, at, uh, at least of going to Mars and astral travel. Uh, she wrote this book about that called The Christ of the Red Planet. Uh, she became very interested in astrology in, in the 1890s too. Um, but I think that, yeah, for her, she, what, what I think is interesting is the way that she was definitely embracing these popular ideas. She was picking up on all of these I don't know. She had a lot of hustle, we would say, right? Like she was always having to make money. She was always having to try to figure out what is this next business that can support my family. Um, and once she became successful, continuing to, to try to support other women's businesses and, and things like that. Um, so I think for her, she she took all of that previous experience and, and previous attitudes she had and carried that with her when she discovered the esoteric and occult. And so that's one of the things that I, I just find really interesting about her. That's wonderful. I wish you could tell us more about this uh, astral travel to Mars, if you want. I think it's the great, a great venue, this one, to you know, delve into this type of details. But I also wanted to ask you, about common sense because you are mentioning um common sense a lot in your article and i found it extremely fascinating because thinking about um a work in esotericism that relies on you know common sense i think it's a very um generative um juxtaposition so do you want to tell us more about mars and common sense <laughs> But I don't know if those two fit together exactly. The, the phrase common sense was one that Kirk used quite a lot in her newspaper articles. And, and she was using it, obviously that's not, it's, that's not a universal concept that's going to be subjective, what we take to be common sense uh, in, in any given moment. But what she meant by it, I think, was, was trying to say um, that 
uh, in trying to give people advice, she was trying to say, you don't necessarily need to spend lots of money. You don't need to do these things. You don't need to be swayed by certain kinds of fashion. You should, you know, have, have good sense in her, in her understanding at least. And, and, you know, listen to what the doctors might tell you. Um, she also sometimes thought that doctors would cave to their patients because they thought it just wouldn't be popular. So she was sort of advocating for this idea of common sense on a number of, in a number of different venues. So doctors should sort of employ their common sense as doctors in treating patients and not um, falling prey to the, the, the fashions of the day and kind of allowing their patients to tell them what they wanted, right? Like, so all of these different layers uh, of, of interest that she had. And I think that it is interesting then that that common sense element comes into her occult and esoteric practices later on, at least with mental science, I would say, um, but also with astrology too, which I didn't, that's not included really very much in the chapter in this book. Um, and, and what she was thinking about with astrology and with mental science as common sense was how can we, first of all, she wanted to write things in a way that was, I think, as accessible as possible. So in her books on astrology, she's like, yeah, there's all of these books where there's charts and there's all of this. It's very confusing and the signs and the rising and all of that. And she just wanted to pare it way down and, and sort of take out what is going to be useful for people? Um, what is going to be, what is going to help them to live better lives and more informed lives in terms of their relationships with other people? So I think that that's where she was coming from, at least with, with common sense. But it was, I think it's a phrase that I ended up using because she used it so much. Um, and maybe I didn't always unpack it in, entirely how she was using it within those different contexts. But I think that was what, her, in her mind, at least, she was trying to advocate for things like being sensible economically, don't overspend, you don't need to buy the fanciest fabric, maybe this other fabric is much more sturdy. I mean, she gets very specific and practical, and maybe these specific yeast cakes are a little bit more expensive, but if they're reliable, then it's it makes more sense to use those over some other cheaper um, yeast cake that she wasn't getting a promotion money for. Um, of course, too, she was she was getting a kind of, you know, paid promotions by some of these companies, too. Um, so I think that that's where her common sense came in. But I, that was for me, that was just, again, one of the things that's interesting about Kirk is how she had laid this very solid foundation for who she was and what she thought about the world. And that changed in some ways quite radically when she encounters esoteric ideas, but in other ways it stays, she stays very much the same in the, in those attitudes that she has towards being sensible and, and trying to get people to act in ways that are going to be better for themselves and for the people around them. I think this is fascinating for a number of ways, in a number of ways, um, of course, because as you say in the art article, it reconfigures the issues around secrecy, for example, that uh, have been associated with esotericism or the occult in general. But also for what Amy was saying before about, you know, including, you know, the everyday the experiences that um, are really part of our lives and and reread them within a framework that um, that stresses, you know, the esoteric elements uh, in it. That is not esotericism or magic or um, the occult. It's not something that necessarily is not already part of our life. Um, and so I think this is also a very important remark. Um, and Mars, tell us about Mars. I think that the story that you tell at the end of the article is fascinating. Uh, do you want to tell us more? Sure. I, I did actually, I have a chapter in, a, in a, the Brill Handbook of UFO Religion, I think is the title. Sorry, Ben Zeller, who edited it, if I'm remembering the title wrong. Um, but that's a, a really fascinating um, moment in, in Kirk's life in, in 1901. So she was in her uh, getting getting close to 70 at that point. And she has this book that she wrote called The Christ of the Red Planet. And that was the title. That was the first book that I had come across of hers. I came across it in a list of publications uh, from a small publishing, a kind of occult related publishing house uh, in Chicago. And I just thought, that is a title. I need to, I need to see if I can find that book and, and 
figure out what is going on with the Christ of the Red Planet. Um, so yeah, she has this experience where she travels um, to Mars and encounters a number of different um, divine beings there, one of which is a telepathic pony uh, named Alceste. So that's a fun, you know, a fun other uh, endeavor. But she also seems to meet her dead sister. And um, so there's spiritualist elements. Uh, and she meets some of these other sort of um, deities, divinities, um, and then finally meets Christ, uh, who is the Christ of that planet. So he's he's red, but he's radiant and and beautiful. And I think why I was the, the way that I was trying to tie it into this chapter was that that was sort of her her vision for herself um, at that stage where she is old and she is wrinkly uh, and she, you know her hair is white that she is able to, to sort of re-embrace her, her beauty and from her youth. And so she reaches a state of perfection and immortality and, and kind of freedom too. Um, everyone is wearing these very shimmery um, kind of translucent robes uh, on, on Mars or they don't have, or, you know, I think, I think uh, Christ doesn't have any shirt on at all. So he's kind of bare chested and, and very beautiful. Uh, so just a fascinating life, I think. Uh, uh, that's where she ends up. You know, she she was born in Rhode Island, uh, and then lived, you know, most of her life in in Brooklyn and New York, and then, but somehow ends up on Mars uh, at the end of her life, too, or near the end of her life. So I, I think that book is an interesting one in that it's it's very unusual uh, for where her interests had been all of her life. That she gets not just to this point of embracing mental science. Uh, but also having this very astral projection sort of an experience too. Thank you. I was very interested being uh, interested in magic uh, in um, in a way that it's related to time and, and different ways to experience time and temporality. I thought it was a very uh, compelling example that I will use in the future. So thank you. Very glad that you um, wrote about it. So I have a number of other questions, but I encourage the audience, if you want some clarifications, if you have some particular questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the Q&A feature or in, yes, yeah, better than the chat box, Q&A feature. And I will happy to um, include some of your questions in the rest of this meeting. So um, how, so I think it's very important for, for my students as well, who are um, approaching the study of magic and esotericism and, and paganism. Um, what is inhabiting the space of Western esotericism or esotericism as we all prefer to call it um, as a woman today? Do you have any, any thought about you know, challenges, opportunities, um, maybe some stories, some experiences of yours, some imagination, some thinking about the future that you want to share with um, our um, other audience and with, with the students in particular? Well, for one thing, I think it's a really, it, it is and continues to be a rich and growing area of study. Um, I think that in this case, there is, there's the study of it, and then the academic institutions that support it. And so it depends on, I would say, what do you want your relationship to those institutions to be? Uh, and where do you see your own, uh, this is for anybody who's interested in this kind of research, what voice do you want to have in your research? And what do you want your institutional relationship to academia to be? And I kind of wanted to, to um, address, there was a question in the chat about inclusivity and the price of the book. And I want to thank the, uh, the writer for actually addressing that because it's, it's, it's an issue. And I, I will say that despite the fact that there are a number of us who have either non or tan tangential relationships with academia, institutionalized academia, that um, I did feel, and we did feel that it was important to do this in an academic context, which means that you have to deal with really kind of not great publishing 
things. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I really have problems with the price of academic publishing, with the gatekeeping around it, with the exclusivity, and to have something that is, that, you know, where we're talking about women who are doing, who, where we want to be accessible, and then we can't, I do see that as, as problematic. So I really want to acknowledge that. At the same time, it was important to do that within that context. Uh, for the women who actually might need to have these publications so that they can advance their careers. I, I think that there are a lot of ways to do research and to write and to be engaged with even the academic discussions around esotericism as a woman um, or as anybody without necessarily feeling like you need to be an academic. But that, you know, academic culture is is a is a challenge is a challenge for everyone i will say however that there are some really great things happening right now um there's the uh, sw uh the you know gosh european society for the study of western esotericism i got it um has now a gender and sexuality section which is a wonderful and really progressive uh section of SWE that is doing some fantastic work and is taking some of the things, the themes that I really wish could have been explored in this book and just kind of running with it. So uh, I think that, that that there are great opportunities right now. Whether there are, are opportunities in academia is kind of a completely separate question, but there are certainly lots of platforms. That's just my experience. Thanks a lot, Amy. I am happy that you mentioned Alice's um, question. I would have uh, asked it. Um, and you are actually, I have to say, engaging with non-scholarly audiences um, a lot. And I, what I admire about your work as well is your ability to be able to engage with audiences that are not only academic, but with the rigor and clarity that comes from your academic background and research. And I think, I don't know, I don't want to, I mean, I know less of your public uh, work, Krista, um, but I think we cannot escape from, you know, trying to engage with, you know, publicly engaged scholarship um, in, in order for us to be able to balance uh, a little bit the, you know, gatekeeping attitudes of of academia and um, you're already doing that and modeling that. So uh, I thank you also for that, Amy. Um, we have a few questions. So one is from the audience. Uh, I'm sorry, Krista, did you want to add anything? Because I <laughs> I just jumped in. Um, no, that that's fine. I, I, I'm happy to, to skip to, to further questions since I think Amy was very comprehensive um, and gave us lots to think about already, so. So one, Adi is asking, can you discuss the intersection of esoteric spirituality and commerce, or maybe more popularly, something akin to conspirituality? You talked about Elena's needs to make money, which coincided with her spiritual interest um, and the way women uniquely found a way to exist in both spaces. That's a um, great question. Question. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I just I've just pulled it up. I was like, I was realizing there's things in the chat and things in the Q and A. So I, I'm one of those visual people. So I'm just rereading re it. Um, yeah, I think I, I definitely think with Eleanor Kirk, she's a great example of that intersection, as as you put it, between esoteric spirituality and commerce. Um, and I think that uh, there are a lot of parallels now. Um, if it wasn't the middle, you know, of the, I mean, the pandemic is still ongoing, of course, uh, COVID-19 is not behind us, but when we were forming the chapters, uh, there was a certain pressure <laughs> uh, that, that I know most of us probably experienced in various areas of our life. And what I think now looking back at that chapter and thinking about how I would maybe shift it or change it a bit, I think I would do more to try to make those connections to contemporary practices that I think are very similar to um, Eleanor Kirk and what she was doing in that in that weaving together of, you know, trying to make a, a buck. And, you know, it, I feel like if she was alive today, she would be 
on Instagram or TikTok. She would be an influencer. She would be, you know, sort of getting all of these product placements. She would be all about hashtags. I mean, this is just pure speculation on my part, but I, there's just, there's certain things about the way she was doing and what she was doing and trying to make, make things, um, make some of these kind of higher occult teachings that were very, very dense and complex and turn them into something that was accessible and useful for um, more average readers. Now, again, she was targeting readers. Um, so she was targeting people who would be accessing textual um, work through newspapers and, and other sorts of things. Um, but it, it was still a way that she was trying to kind of come from some of these very dense um, theosophical and other sorts of works of the 1880s. Uh, if anyone's ever tried to read The Secret Doctrine or some of these other, you know, very enormous sorts of theosophical works, um, they're not the easiest to get through. And so she, I, I think that that's something that I thought was kind of interesting was how she's both kind of selling her her own ideas, but also doing this work of repackaging ideas and uh, kind of doing that in a way that could be beneficial. Um, one of the things I also really like about her in terms of maybe commerce and uh, esoteric spirituality too is, is just the way that she was very interested in helping, in trying to help other, uh, especially women with small businesses that she became aware of and who would write to her. She would. She also published in the late 1880s before she really got into the occult. Um, she had published these books about writing and about how to get published basically. So some of the questions about like how to, how to get into um, publishing or how to get into these conversations she was really interested in those kinds of things. And she wrote these very practical, like there was a directory called periodicals that pay contributors. Mm -hmm. And it would it was this directory of all of these different periodicals at the time, how much they would pay for what kinds of articles, kind of, I don't know that she went quite as far as acceptance rates, but she definitely sort of laid out this, this directory as a way to try to help um, other people to, uh, become financially independent. And so I just thought that, that was kind of interesting that she was, yeah, bringing these kinds of ideas together and really embracing that sort of entrepreneurialism, uh, even as she was getting into the esoteric and occult. So thanks yeah, for that. I'm, I've been really fascinated by this whole question. And it's kind of intersecting with, um, so I'm, I'm working on a collection of Ethel Colquhoun's magical essays currently. And I keep coming back to Kirk and also to uh, Julia Phillips had a great piece on Madeleine Montalban in the book. And both, well, all three of them actually were doing a lot of writing for money. And they were writing in these periodicals. They were doing this kind of, you know, esoteric journalism, having columns. And it, so I've I've thought about this in a way that uh, did this keep some of these women from having a higher profile because they were making money, but they were actually publishing in in publications that were ephemeral. And so they weren't publishing like, you know, Dion Fortune's actually a good kind of counterexample where she had the books. And also, you know, because when you're doing that, those kinds of books, you have to have somebody who is paying for the publishing of them. And even in the day, you had to have a, establish a market. But, you know, the women we're working with were, again, using magic as a tactic, a survival tactic, because they were using it to make money. And that's also something that's kind of, you know, we see this in, in the kind of contemporary wellness stuff that I see is in many ways an inheritance of the kind of work that, that, that Kirk was doing, where there's this tendency to uh, delegitimize any kind of commercial, any kind of commercial end or transaction uh, or framing of a call esoteric and magical subjects, but then we look at how that impacts women's practice and ideas about women's practice. And I think there are definitely some questions to be asked there about those intersections and our judgments of them. 
Fantastic. Thank you both for these um, answers. I think you touched on very, very, very important points. There are many fantastic questions in, um, in the chat box. So one, I put two questions together. So um, Kyla asked, how do non-affiliated scholars, especially women, find each other and find places for publication? And Sam asks, um, so I recognize that this is not directly related to the substance of the lecture at hand, but could I ask Amy what it means to her to be unaffiliated to an institution and what it means practic in practical terms to be a scholar in the mold that she's in, given that academia is, such, is in such a generalized state of collapse, but many of us may still want to research religion in one form or another, institutional affiliation or not, I would appreciate further reflection on this. So how we find each other and how is it, you know, uh, doing research um, as an, an unaffiliated um, scholar? These are, um, th these are great questions. Uh, the first thing that I would ask anybody uh, about you know, who's interested in these kinds of, let's just call them conversations. Uh, first, ask what it is that you want out of it. Do you are you interested in having an academic position? Are you interested in being involved in scholarly conversations? I am very fortunate in the fact that I was able to just walk away from academia, which was my choice. I wanted to do it, but I also have the background and the skills and also the colleagues to still be able to do scholarly research if that's something that I choose to do, which at the moment, it's not really what I want to do. I actually want to be doing more popular work. So I'm a freelance writer and I do a lot of work writing for galleries and I'm very lucky in the sense that I'm able to do that as a living, you know? Um, so I would think, what do you, what do you want to do? Because I do, I am academically trained. So I know how to, to speak that language when I need to. But find out what what it is that what it is that you want out of that. There are great organizations. SWE is wonderful. The American Academy of Religion has some really fantastic and robust uh, work going on in paganism and esotericism. Do you want to be a part of a scholarly conversation? There's also the Magical Women's Conference, uh, and and they do all sorts of things coming out of London, and they have both academics and non-academics. So. I would say find out what what you want and then figure out, you know, just find what routes you need to take to, to meet that, because there are also lots of ways to, to publish in this area. It just depends on what kind of publishing you want to do. And if I can, thank you, Amy, if I can jump in the con to the conversation, Kyla, Sam, very practically, as a co-chair of the Pagan Studies Unit, and I think you, Chris, as well as the co-chair of the Esotericism Unit at AAR, um, both our units accept papers from students, from scholars who are not affiliated, from uh, practitioners even. And um, if it's good, if it's shareable, if it's you know thought provoking, it's gonna make it. And so, if you're interested in um, in inhabiting the academic space in a way that is not necessarily um, the kind of um, mainstream one you're more than welcome. You won't be the only one. Um, to, a, to a certain extent, we are all sort of navigating this uh, academic belonging and, and affiliation in, in different ways and, and different from, you know, what it used to be. Um, so please reach out to me if you want, and I can give you more details about um, how to do that. And of course, it's extended to all our audience and friends, so share the word. Krista, do you have anything to share on this before we wrap up? No, I think I think uh, you covered it. I'm just I'm still I'm reading all these great questions in the chat. So if we don't get to them, maybe I can. Uh, you, you said that they can contact you. So feel free to send them uh, send them Giovanna's way and we can uh, she can send them our way too. since I was like, oh, I want to get to this one about age and beauty. Yes, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think we have time for one more. So pick one question. I, I, I was just really interested with this, uh, this discussion about the Melissa in the in the chat said that um, she's talking about the connection between beauty and old age or women in old age. 
Um, and what it is, is it about Eleanor Kirk and maybe esotericism itself that can allow us to rethink the meaning of beauty in terms of age, womanhood, et cetera. Um, I won't go, go into all of it, but I just think it's quite interesting. Um, I was, I was talking before we started the webinar, I said, I might talk, I might say something about menopause magic. And now I have this chance to do so. One of the things that I find really interesting about Kirk among many things and also another woman who I have spent a long time researching, I haven't published on her yet, but Alice Bunker Stockham, who was a medical doctor um, turned mental scientist and, and occultist in Chicago, right in the similar time period in the 1890s. Both of them were born in the 1830s, and both of them sort of get into the occult, at least do more embracing of the occult later in their lives. So when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s is really where the writings that kind of approach the, the field of esotericism and occultism the most um, when, when they generate that. And I think that's interesting for a lot of reasons in terms of thinking about that issue of age. I mean, some of it might be this desire for the lost beauty of youth uh, that both of them seem to get into to, to some extent. But I think some of it is also where they are in life. They both were mothers. They, their children had been sort of raised at that point, although they still had some responsibilities in other, in, uh, in other familial directions, both of them. But I just, for me, I, I find that really interesting and fascinating and kind of hopeful, right? That, that there is this possibility for um, later in life uh, developments. Uh, and I guess I think about the, the attitudes towards beauty in that way. Um, some accounts of Eleanor Kirk when she was old actually do talk about how beautiful she is, you know, so, oh, her silver hair and the, you know, how white and pure white it is and all of these things. So I think that was kind of that to me, that's also interesting that maybe they were trying to challenge some of those issues about aging, even as the fantasy in Eleanor Kirk's mind, at least, was this very youthful vision of herself and the color hair that she always wanted to have. She she finally has when she's on Mars. Um, but in other ways, I think it's it's quite interesting that they're able to to think about shifting into this entirely new field and new area when they're in their you know sixties, basically, which I think is really fascinating. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I think it's almost time to wrap up. And I really loved all the questions. So I really encourage um, all of you who are interested in reaching out to me to us to write me an email. I will share that, the email with my um, today's guests. And um, Hilary, if you can copy the question and send them over to us, um, I think we will we'll be able to, you know, uh, take a look, a closer look at, at those as well um, after the event today. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Krista, for this, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you all for being here. It was really a conversation between not only the three of us, but they included um, our audience. And I'm so happy to, um, to being able to host this type of events. Um, so um, Please, all of you, stay tuned on the activities of the CSWR, um, the TNT Initiative, the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative, and of Nosiologies. Uh, one last shout out, our next event will be on March 8th. I will have a conversation with Dr. Grace Nono, a performing artist, ethnomusicologist, and scholar of Filipino shamanism on music, voice, and healing. So you can find all the information on the CSWR website about this event and all the others. We'll try to gather, I see in the comments, information about potential bibliography, references. We'll try to gather this information and we'll be try to reach out to, to you. Uh, thanks again uh, to all of you and have a lovely, lovely day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.